All right, well, today we're embarking on a journey in a series through the book of Jonah. Uh, And this, of course, is a famous story out of the Hebrew Bible that is uh, pretty well known to those both inside and outside of the church, right? Uh, You know, uh, not not everybody knows the details, but at at the very least, people know that there's a big fish involved. And of course, if you read through the book of Jonah, which we're going to do in its entirety over these next few weeks, you quickly come to realize that the big fish is far from being the central theme of the book. No doubt it's a miraculous extension of God's grace to Jonah, but it's not the central theme. Now, there are plenty of people, even some theologians that that lean kind of more liberal, that say that this story is just an allegory that it didn't literally happen, that it's a a nice tale or a fable for a kid's Sunday school class, but we can't believe that Jonah actually spent three days and three nights in the belly of a big fish. And I know that in 2024, that people in this modern age with their modern sensibilities and in our culture have a hard time believing this to be true. But I want to kind of dispel that kind of thinking at the outset here, and here's why. I I could say all sorts of things uh, to try to convince you of the power of God to do literally anything that he wants, which I do believe he is sovereign and he has the power to do anything that he wants. And that's absolutely true. But for me, the only thing that is needed in my estimation are the words of Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself. When he says in Matthew chapter 12, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Of course, talking about his death and crucifixion and, and his spending the, the three days that he spent in the grave. So either Jesus was a liar, which he isn't, or he believed that it actually happened. And so for me, and hopefully for you this morning, if Jesus believed it, I believed it. Amen? If it's true for Jesus, then it's true for me. Now, at the outset here, I want to confess something to you. And I was talking with the worship team earlier today as we were rehearsing. I don't have a very high view of Jonah. Uh, As I was working on the graphic for the series, I went out to the interwebs to see what other churches had come up for their sermon uh, series through Jonah. And I stumbled on one that made me laugh, where it had Jonah's name, and the tagline was, the worst prophet who ever lived. (laughs) Now, I I think, I'm not sure that that's totally fair, although he certainly would be a contender for that title. Now, here's why I have such a low view of Jonah. As I read through the account, I think that he is someone who literally falls asleep on the job, Uh, and we're going to see that in a moment as we read the, the first chapter. I think that Jonah is lazy, I think that he has a strong prejudice against an entire people group. I think that, and probably most importantly, he disobeys God. I think that he's a complainer. I think he pouts like a child. I think that he lacks grace and compassion and love for others. I think that, and, and, and this is what we're going to focus primarily on today, I think that he is not true to his calling and abandons his job on his call. (laughs) I could say so much more, Bruce, but I I think you have a sense of my opinion about Jonah. He is really, in a sense, the anti-hero. He's not the hero of the story. And you know, I'm not going to try to convince you otherwise, or myself otherwise for that matter, but here's what I know to be true. And so I want to to say it first to myself and then to you. And that is that we, all of us, myself included, can tend to be exactly like Jonah. You know, it can be easy for us to Monday morning, or in this case, Sunday morning quarterback, uh, when we read this story. But I want to suggest to you this morning that Jonah's story is our story. That all of us can be guilty of all of the things that I just mentioned as well. And so as we go through this story, instead of looking at Jonah's actions and saying to ourselves, what was he thinking? Why in the world would he do that? 
Why would he make that choice? Why would he say those things? I want to invite you to join me in asking those questions of ourselves. What am I thinking? Why did I do that? Why did I make that choice? Why did I say those things? And if you'll join me on that journey, I think that you'll find that all of us are more like Jonah than we would care to admit. So as we go through the story, I want to encourage you to be self-reflective. And don't judge Jonah, judge yourself. Now our text is a bit long this morning. The entire book is 48 verses, that's four chapters. We're going to read 17 of this, them this morning. So bear with me as I read through chapter 1. You ready, Caleb? All right, here we go. Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to the son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran, ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, which is modern-day Tel Aviv, where he found a ship bound for that port. After, the paying, after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own god, small g, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your god. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. And they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And he answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And this terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. And the sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm, the sea calm for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. And then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. And at this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thanks be to God. Pray with me for a moment. Father, we invite you to speak to us this morning. Uh, Lord, I invite you to be used as your uh, conduit, as your vessel, as your servant this morning of this, this word. And Lord, help us to have the eyes uh, of, of humility. Help us to humbly um, take on the story of Jonah as our own. And help us and forgive us, Lord, when we fail you and when we stumble and we fall, that we might stand up and rise up again and turn around and go in your direction as we seek to honor and serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I used to be a cross-country runner. I know you look at my freshly minted 48-year-old body this morning and you cannot tell. Uh, but I used to be tall and lanky. Now I'm just tall and not so lanky. Uh, and some of you said, I can't, I can't see that, Tim. But when it comes to running, to be frank, my knees are so bad, I just can't run anymore. It just, it just hurts too much. 
But you know, when I was younger, I loved the challenge of running long distance, specifically cross country. I ran all three seasons. But I did well on the track team in high school, mainly because I was able to dig deep and find the stamina to keep on going. I can remember countless races at my track meets where so many along the course would just give up. They were walking just off to the side, trying to catch their breath, but I just kept on going. Uh, it's funny, for a city kid, you know, we, we used to, where, where, is, where do you run cross country in Manhattan? Well, you have to take the one train all the way to the end of the line, and at the end of the one train in the Bronx, there's a place called Van Cortlandt Park, and for our city, us city kids, we're like, oh, we've arrived in the woods. Like, this is where the woods is. We didn't know. But in the scripture, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to uh, the Corinthians and elsewhere to Timothy and in the book of Hebrews, uses this metaphor of running in relation to the spiritual life, that we should run the race with endurance, that we should all finish well. And that is absolutely true. But sometimes, I know, at least for me and maybe for you, we are running the wrong race. Let me illustrate that for a moment. I remember once one of my teammates on a day where there was a citywide meet and there were a lot of different races going on, uh, there were a huge number of races, showed up to the start of a race that he was not supposed to run. And uh, we, he lined up at the start line and he, he ran the wrong race. And of course, he was disqualified. And we on the team all had a good laugh about it. But here's where I'm going with this. Here in Jonah chapter 1, Jonah is running the wrong race. Instead of running towards God and towards his will, not just for Jonah, but for the people of Nineveh, it becomes very clear that he's running away from it, right? If God tells you to go north, which is what God was telling Jonah to do, and you go south, either you didn't hear him clearly or you're actively disobeying his instruction. I know that none of you probably never do that, but, but truth be told, I do that sometimes. And maybe some of you can relate. Sometimes we just show up to the wrong race and we run in the opposite direction and God invites us to run towards him and to do and say the things that he has called us to do and say to serve one else, to, to point others to Christ, to whatever it is, to, to, to fight for justice, to serve the poor in body and spirit. And it's like we put the invitation that God has sent to us back in the mail with the words return to sender. We essentially say, you must have gotten the wrong person. Have you ever done that? Well, that's what Jonah is doing right here. I, I mean, the invitation and the ask is very clear from the word go. Back to verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. And, and, and for those of you in foundations as a class, we're running with two other churches. Pastor John last weekend talked about the office of, of the prophet. And when, when the word came to the prophet, that was as if it was the word of God. It had the authority of the word of God. So Jonah's receiving this message, and it's very clear. This is what God intends. And he says, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. And it becomes very clear in the following verses that Jonah just d does not want to do or say what God has called him to. Now, I think that there are many reasons for this, but probably one of the most significant is that a prophet of God in the history of prophets has never, up to this point in Scripture, been asked to give a prophetic word to anyone other than the Jewish people. I mean, you might be able to argue that Moses definitely gave a word to the Pharaoh, but for the office of the prophet... When Moses was around, there was no prophetic office. When, for the office of the prophet, Jonah is the first that has been asked to give a word to people who are not followers of God. Every one of the prophets that came before Jonah were given words directly from God for his people. And it was usually a word of rebuke or correction 
or repentance so that God's people could make a shift in their thinking and in their actions and in their worship to serve and honor God. But here with Jonah, the word is to a foreign people, to a pagan nation. And by the way, the Ninevites had a reputation in the ancient world as a powerful and brutal force in the ancient Assyrian Empire to be reckoned with. So he might have been a little afraid to deliver this word to such a mighty city. Now, there's a myriad of different reasons, which I will allude to over the course of this series, that Jonah uh, would have rejected this instruction from God. But for now, I just want to focus on the fact that God had called him to a hard place to do a hard thing. And the truth of the matter is God often calls you and I, you and me, to hard places to do hard things. And if, if we're a follower of Jesus today, I wonder, has that been our experience? It certainly has been mine. I, I, would, like to, I would like things to go a certain way, uh, to do some things but not others. But it seems as though God has a way of asking me to do things that I don't want to do to the hard pla- in the hard places and, and ask me to do hard things. And I wonder if you have experienced the same thing. But it's in those hard places that God often does his best work. And this truth applies in so many Areas. I've seen it in my own life, and I've seen it in the life of others that I have ministered to over the years. The Christian life is not an easy life or totally efficient ede- endeavor. Neither is the road to healing. You know, when it comes to trauma and emotional and spiritual well-being, oftentimes the, the process and the pathway to healing is often to go back and visit the pain in order to move forward. And how many of you know that's not a pleasant thing to do? I don't want to do that. Wendy's with me. She doesn't want to do that, right? It's hard to go back to those painful places, but I can tell you with absolute certainty that there is, the pathway to healing is to, to go through that in order that you can go to a, a healthier place. And so that's uncomfortable. And we can say no to that. But when we do, we miss out on what God has for us. So God here asked Jonah to run towards the Ninevites, And Jonah shows up to a different race and runs in the opposite direction. Now, uh, one more quick word about prophets. The job of a prophet is not an easy one. It's a difficult one. If you read through some of the other prophetic books, you see prophets like Jeremiah in particular, who laments his job. He's like, would you take this assignment away from me? And yet he obeys God. Nobody listens to him. In fact, God essentially says, I want you to go to my people with these words uh, through you, but nobody's going to listen to you. They're going to ignore you. It sounds like fun, doesn't it? And here's the truth. Proclaim it as loud and effectively as you can. Oh, and by the way, just nobody's going to listen, right? Doesn't sound like a job I want to sign up for. And it's not just Jeremiah, but Elijah and Isaiah and Amos and Hosea is, an, uh, Hosea is another one uh, in particular. I love that, that story where Hosea is delivering this, 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 this message of, hey, God is married to us. God loves us so much, it's like, a, it's like a, a wedding union. And yet, you have left him like a spouse has left their spouse. There was no happy days for Hosea. It was hard. And so God has directed Jonah to deliver a message and to give the Ninevites the word from the Lord And he says no with his feet. Now, when it comes to verse 3, and I don't have it up there for you, but it says Jonah ran away from the Lord. I wonder if you're like me when you you look at at that and kind of laugh. 
Right? This is kind of like a funny idea. It's laughable that we would be able to run from the Lord. In fact, Jonah says to those sailors, when the storm is raging, I serve the Lord who made all of this. So he knows God is everywhere. He knows God is there, present with them. He knows that he, knows that he can see Jonah's disobedience, and yet he is falling asleep in the bottom of the boat. It's like, you know, when you have three kids, they're older now, but when, when they were young, two or three years old, you know, if you, if they, if they, sometimes they would say, Daddy, I'm going to hide from you, and they cover their eyes. Right there, they're right there. I can see them. They're not invisible, but they're covering their eyes. This is the kind of thing. It's laughable. They're not, they don't disappear once they cover their eyes. They just can't see you, right? And this is what's happening with Jonah. Sound asleep in the storm. I wonder if he was thinking, if I just go to sleep, maybe when I wake up, everything will be back to the way it was before. Have you ever done that? You've done something wrong. You've done something that you're ashamed of, and you're just like, I'm just going to go to sleep. And maybe tomorrow, it will be like a dream. And then you realize it's still there. Listen, in case you missed it in the story, Jonah's disobedience sets off a chain reaction that affects others, right? The others on the boat. And notice in verse 7, if you still have it open, the others asked who has brought this calamity on us, and they cast lots. Of course, that's total superstition, but they come up with the right answer, and it's Jonah. And, and, and there they're trying to hurl the cargo overboard. They're rowing ferociously, ferociously to try to keep uh, the boat in, 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 in the right place. And there's Jonah. And as he wakes from his slumber, he realizes what's going and ultimately owns it to a point. He, he says, well, this is, I have brought this on you, right? That his decision to run from God has followed him all the way to the boat. And so... His ultimate solution, at least here in chapter one, is throw me overboard. It's my fault. Now, I want to pause here for a moment and say that I think that there is such an important lesson in Jonah's story for us. And that's, the, that's this, is that our sin has consequences that extend beyond ourselves. Let me say that again. Our sin, my sin has consequences that extend beyond myself, beyond ourselves. When we sin, when we disobey what God is asking of us and what he has called us to, those choices impact others around us. We do not sin in a vacuum. My sin affects my family. My sin affects my friends and this church. It has the potential to affect this church. But I know enough about life and responding to God's pursuit of a relationship with me to know that I am not the only one where this truth applies. This is true for every one of us. I have a friend, really, kind of a mentor, Pastor Peter Pendell. Some of you know him. He pastored Millington Baptist Church for 30 years. He is an honorable, wonderful man of God. And myself and a group of four or five other pastors from area churches gather together here at Newbridge once a month. And it's kind of like he's just trying to build into younger pastors and encourage us to keep, keep the fight, to stay on the right track and to build into us. He's a great man. But he gives, he gives every pastor he mentors a, a, a silver dollar. This is mine. I carry it in my backpack. And he has a whole explanation about it, which I can't get into. I, mean, I can't even remember all the details. But what I know is that this represents me not cheating on my wife. This represents me not stealing any money. This represents me being an honorable person, a person of character, a person of honesty. And what Peter says to all of us and said to me when he gave me this coin is, think about the implications for everybody involved if you fall. Think about how this will impact your family. Think about how this will damage the church if you decide to, to do something really stupid. 
our sin affects not just us, but everybody else. And for Jonah, these sailors, they didn't do anything, and yet the storm is raging all around them. And finally, Jonah says, yeah, it was me. It was me. And I could give you any number of examples through the scripture. Uh, You don't have to look any further than the first few pages. We are all paying or dealing with the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin, right? David sinned with Bathsheba, orchestrating the killing of her husband Uriah on the battlefield, which led to uh, turmoil with David's own family and the kingdom as a whole. Achan's thievery at the Battle of Jericho led to Israel's initial defeat and his family's execution. Judas betraying Jesus. And of course, which led to the cross. Here's what I want to say to you this morning. We grow together. You, you've heard me say, if you've been around Newbridge for any length of time, you heard me say that we were created as an us, that we grow together as the body of Christ, that we grow in, in, in maturity and understanding. But sometimes we also limp along because of choices that we make. And this is why it's so important to pray for one another. This is why it's so important. I so value and appreciate the fact that there are people, there's a group of people that gather every Sunday morning downstairs in this building to pray for our service, to pray for me, to pray for the worship, to pray for you all coming here. It's so important. It's so important that we, we band together and help each other fight against temptation and to encourage each other. And yes, even when it's called for to correct one another so that we can grow together emotionally and spiritually, not as the sick body of Christ, but as the renewed and redeemed and healthy body of Christ. Amen. And yet how many of us, present company included, are around, uh, are sound, sound asleep sometimes when the storm is raging all around us? pretending that our actions have no consequences. And this is why we tend in those situations to act out and try to numb ourselves to sin's unavoidable reality instead of facing the music and confessing our sin before a holy God. Jonah will get there eventually, but at this point, even his instructions to the rest of the crew to hurl him overboard who, by the way, those folks evidently from the text have an amazing salvation conversion moment, and they make vows to God. More on that in a moment. Even Jonah's instructions to them to throw him overboard is not a moment of reckoning. It's a moment of fatalism, was the best word that I could come up with. Jonah's basically saying, you might as well get rid of me, because this storm ain't going away unless I'm gone. And you see, here's, here's what I want you to catch. Jonah in this moment, and this, this is a reference to the question uh, during the break. Jonah in this moment can't be who or what God has called him to be, namely, in this case, a, a, a mouthpiece for, uh, uh, for uh, the Almighty God. He can't be, not because God has abandoned Jonah, but because Jonah has abandoned God and his will. He would rather meet his end than come to terms with his choice. We can't be the women and men that God has called us to be when we choose out of what God has for us. He has a call for you. He has a purpose for you. But we have to choose in. You know, I was thinking this week as I was preparing uh, for today, how often... God has prompted me to speak, and I haven't. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. And when we do that, not only do we miss out on what God has for us in participating with him in his purposes, but we can't be the people that God has called us to be because even if just for a moment we have forsaken God, big G, for something or someone else, And I want to tell you this morning that there's a reason that in God's top 10 list of 10 commandments, number one is you shall not have any other gods before me. 
What are your idols? You know, what Jonah was facing, and, and I, unfortunately I faced this uh, with others as a pastoral leader over the years. We've never done it this way before, right? We're trying something new. Well, we've never done it this way before. Well, you know, and this is what Jonah's saying. I've never has a prophet been asked to give a word to a foreign nation. And he's essentially saying, I want to be God in this situation. I want to make my own decisions. You can't tell me what to do. But that's exactly what God does. We don't know his ways. We don't know all of his purposes. He asks us to conform to and submit to his will. And sometimes we just don't want to do that. And so God says through the prophet Isaiah, I am the Lord. And that is my name, and I will not yield my glory to another or praise to idols. Full stop. And so when that happens, don't be surprised. When, when it happens that we, that we decide our own will instead of his, don't be surprised who God uses to wake you up and get you back on track. You know, if you have kids, don't be surprised if one of them, whether consciously or unconsciously, is used as the mouthpiece of God to say, Daddy, aren't we supposed to da, da, da? And you're like, yeah, kid, I know. You're right. Now that they're adults, it's a little harder to kind of brush them off. It's happened to me so many times. Or maybe it's a coworker. Or maybe it's a neighbor. Or maybe it's your spouse. Come on, somebody. How many of you who are married have had your spouse speak uh, words of truth over you? Come on. But for Jonah, it was a pagan sailor and his friends who incidentally has come, has, who for him, he has a come to Jesus moment along with his peers, and they worship the one true God. And in verse 16, they greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Listen, the bottom line is God will be honored by you or someone else, but make no mistake, he does not share his glory with anyone else or anything else. And in that moment, the surprise is that Jonah, who should have known better, was in a sense overshadowed by the sailors who didn't really know better at all. And yet they were in awe of God's power and God's glory, and they choose in while Jonah chooses out. And in a way, in a weird way, now stick with me here, this is actually good news. It's good news for me. Because what it tells me is that even when I mess up, others are still drawn to glorify the one true God. That even when I stumble and fall, God is gracious and he uses my story and the consequences of my sin to draw others to him. And you see, that's why I started out today by challenging you that Jonah's story is our story. It's easy for us to sit back and say, this guy, I mean, come on, what was he thinking? And yet, how many times do you and me do something stupid and say to ourselves, what was I thinking? And yet God, in his grace, still works in our midst. Now, hear me now. I'm not advocating for disobedience here. I'm just saying that our God is so infinitely gracious and loving, and we're going to see a lot of that in, in chapter 4 He's so infinitely gracious and loving that he works in and moves in the hearts of others in spite of our disobedience and sin. Praise God for that. Hear me now. I am, as your pastor, I'm far from perfect, but God still works. Our leadership here, our board, our elders, as much as I love them, and I love every single one of them, none of them are perfect. And yet God still leads through them. And praise God, that's good news. And friends, as we, as a church uh, body, as a church congregation, seek to do more and to impact our community through things like ESL and the food pantry, know this, none of us in this room, none of you listening on the live stream are perfect, but God will still lead and move in and through us. Praise God. The question is, when we fall, 
When we stumble, when we walk in the wrong direction, do we turn around and own our sin and walk back in the direction of Jesus? That essentially is what repentance is. Repentance is an about face. And by the way, if you read through the book of Jonah, it's all about direction change. Jonah's going in one direction, now he's going in the other. Repentance is saying, yes, I have messed up, and now I walk towards the cross. I, I am owning this, and I confess this to you, O God. I am imperfect, and I am walking back in your direction. God doesn't expect us to be perfect. None of us are. That will take a whole lifetime plus a day. But for now, what God asks of you and me, like he did, like David, like David did, when David did mess up, he owned his stuff. And that's why God says David, even though he was far from perfect, was a man after God's own heart. Would we be the kind of people that don't try to uh, run away from our problems, to run away from our disobedience? Would we be the kind of people that have not fallen asleep pretending that it is not there and that it'll just disappear automatically? Would we be the kind of people that now wake up and turn in the right direction and come before a holy God and say, you are holy and I am not. Please fill in all the spaces. Fill in all the cracks. We declared this morning, I plead the blood. I plead the blood of Christ. Because in my own effort, I do not have what it takes. But he does. And he will wash us white as snow. Grace abounds. And for Jonah in this moment, God provides his grace in the form of a great big fish. Where Jonah would hang out for the next three days. Not drowning and sinking into the deep but safe, even if a little creepy, in the belly of a big fish. So I want to ask you today, what, what race are you running? Are you running the race that the Apostle Paul frequently spoke of, the race that God has set before you? Or are you showing up to the wrong race like my friend in high school? You know, the truth is there are many outside the walls of this church that are running their own race and not the one that God has called them to, but the same can be true, now hear me now, of some of us today inside these walls, that we might be physically here in this space today, but we are actively running another race. And no one else might even know it. Maybe we don't even know it. And it all comes down to who and what you are serving and yielding to. Is that God or is that someone or something else? I want to encourage you this morning. It's never too late to start running the right race and show up at the start line or even midway in that race. Your coach wants you to get in the right race. Even your peers want you to get in the right race. Because in the end, if you are running the right race that God has called you to, everyone is better for it. And so the question this first chapter of Jonah pushes me to ask of myself is, have I rendered my calling uh, to, of God or from God null and void because of my disobedience? Have you? Have we as the church gone down paths, run different races that God has never asked us to run? Because ultimately for each one of us, in light of the Great Commission, we are called to be witnesses of the gospel, to be salt and light of this world. Have we compromised that call because we run after something else? Whatever it may be, comfort, financial wealth, political power, whatever it is, are we running after things that are leading us away from our true calling? Have we compromised our call because we think like Jonah that we are maybe better than those people? We're superior to those people. Or that God's love and grace is only for me, but not for you. Are we hoarding God's grace? 
or are we sharing it freely? Listen, God has called each one of us to be world changers. He's called us to make an impact in our community. Are we forsaking that call? He's called us to be uh, vessels and conduits of his healing and grace to the people around us. He's given each one of us gifts today to use for his glory. Are we using them for him or for our own purposes? He's empowered each one of us for great things. Have we abandoned the call like Jonah and run in the opposite direction? I'm out of time. I'm over time. But just one thought as we close. There's a story in the Gospels where Jesus is on a boat with his disciples. And suddenly a great storm is raging around them. And Jesus is the one that's asleep. And his disciples run to him and say, Rabbi, don't you care? We're going to drown here. This, don't you see the storm is raging all around us? And Jonah is the one who gets up and he calms, I mean, sorry, Jesus. Jesus is the one who stands up and calms the storm. Jonah's the one that goes down, but Jesus is the one that stands up. And so God, in his grace, even shows us a redemption of that story. That he's the one that rescues. That he's the one that provides for us purpose, calling, peace, grace, love, all of it. And in him we trust. Amen? Amen.